Good morning, good morning, good morning. Let me show you something. Trash never came last week. Does anybody in Monroe know about that? So it was supposed to come Thursday morning. Great snowstorm, right? And it never came. And so it's been sitting there since Wednesday night. Good morning, Miss Susie. We're heading over to the church. Turn on the lights. Your face is dirty. What were you into? Oh, she says, nope, I'm not working today. Where's the sun, Norma? Gone for today. Could feel it. Just could feel it in my bones. The sun was closing up shop. It's cold. It is looking more and more. As I look at the long range forecast for Sunday, that uh, our 8 a.m. service may just be singing and celebrating inside, which is fine. I've got my guitar. We've got our songs. We will sing if it's beautiful but still cold. Right, Pastor Susie? If it's beautiful but still cold, you can go out to the pavilion all you want. <laughs> Hang out, enjoy the sunrise, all of those things. Cleaned a little bit yesterday, getting ready for Thursday's service. I wanted to check in with everybody this morning here from Churchtown. Some worship comments have caused quite a conversation. I, here's something that I really respect about this nearly two years. It started out as cleaning day at the church and moved to turning on the lights. I can rarely, maybe twice, remember um, an aggressive or a rude comment. And one of those times was from a person, you know, who was what they say trolling, found us and said something awful about Christians and churches and all of those things. Good morning, sir. It is you whom we worship. How do we worship you? Isn't it great to be in a country where we can discuss how we worship God? Does that make sense to you guys? We talk about all of the different types of churches. We talk about all of the different types of music. We talk about all of the different types of venues. Can we just stop for a minute? Good morning. Good morning. Can we just stop for a minute there? Let's stop there. Good morning, Rachel. You understand what I'm saying? In a lot of places around the world, you're either in a basement or you're someplace maybe under a corrugated tin roof or there's a converted building and that's it. That's what you've got. There are instruments. Big bands, little bands, guitars, pianos, no. Singing and celebrating, making music with whatever you can make, whatever you might have. I hope the sun's coming. So, you know, we argue about worship and people, all, people always think that I'm arguing about the means of worship. No. I'm only ever concerned about the object of worship. So like I said, I was thinking last evening about all of our conversation, which first of all, I respect our conversation so much. And I've enjoyed that so much. And maybe you can say that we have been lucky, but I really think it is just an environment that we have created here where people can say stuff and then and talk. And then my mind went to Wow, the fact that we are able to talk about how we worship and where we worship in the United States is, first of all, elevated above most conversations about worship. <clears throat> um, and so let's keep that in mind. It's, 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 and, and the second point is that it's not about where or how. It's about who or what. 
Who, as in Jesus Christ? What, the negative side of that? Some idol. Yourself, the church, the entertainment, some heresy, whatever the case may be. <clears throat> I've said it again. I've said it many, many times. Whether you are a home group, a youth group, small, medium, large, or online church, the focus of your teaching, the focus of your worship is Jesus Christ, Christ-centered. Now, the one other thing that I said yesterday that people thought, oh, I never, and a couple of folks said to me privately, I never thought of it that way. And you've caused me to think. And I think that is a good thing too, right? Let us reason together. Are we doing, remember yesterday when I said, are we doing worship a disservice simply by the verbiage that we use in terms of our liturgy? We're carving out 20 minutes of worship. And I'm not saying that it's intentional or bad or anything of that nature. I say, are we doing the idea of worshiping Christ with every breath that we take, worshiping him as we're in the word, worshiping him as we're giving, worshiping him as we're praying, a teaching and gathering strength to worship him with every breath we take outside of the church? You know, are we doing a disservice by carving out and saying, this is our worship time? Because that can unintentional. An unintended consequence of that, an unintended, unintended consequence could be that we compartmentalize worship. And so I'm glad that that caused a few folks to think about that and, 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 and say, oh, well, yeah, we, we don't want to teach that. I mean, it's for convenience sake. I know I, I've done it as well. I no longer do it because I've thought through that in, in, in our uh, I, I switch it around what our liturgy looks like and what it, what it sounds like, but it'll say our worship through our giving, our worship through word, our worship in song, our worship through our prayers, those sorts of things to try to open up that idea that worship is everything. Uh, and I think especially when it comes to church, right? So again, not... Um, I'm not sitting here saying, American churches, they only worship for 20 minutes. No, I'm saying a simple concept as we as leaders or whatever the case may be, wherever we are in, in the church, uh, are we doing this idea of worship, which we're taught in the Bible, is who we are. When we become a submitted follower of Christ, we become a worshiper of Christ. And, and so are we... Do we expound upon that when we're gathered together so young believers know that? Yes, well, see, that is exactly what I'm talking about. What, you know, and I want to go back and see what else you had to say, Steve, because I, I didn't look. But that's right. And so that exactly what I'm saying, Steve. It is about, Norma said, living sacrifice. It is about our lives. It is about church submitted. It is about individuals submitted. It is about family submitted. It is about under, you know, being in a, in a state of worship, right? So that, that's all I'm saying is that when, if, especially if you're not a Steve DiBiase or an individual who has grown up with this idea, maybe you've come into the church and you say, oh, this is how it works. Um, I worship God for this 20 minutes, and then I listen to this guy or girl for 20 minutes, and then I, right? And, and I'm saying, can we be, we, we just, sh I think should be cognizant of that, that we could be an unintended consequences of the way that we express our, our order of worship, order of worship, worship service, the whole thing, right? The whole thing. And then we say, worship time, you know, right? <clears throat> and then, because you, know, you can see how that leads sometimes. Exactly. Yeah, oh, okay, gotcha. So, yeah. Good morning, Janine. Good morning. I intend to have an awesome day. I intend to have an awesome day. I, how, could you, how could it not be an awesome day when uh, you're saved, Right? 
Exactly. So the, and again, as we grow as a congregation, I, I really think intentionally as, particularly intentionally as leaders, obviously, we should be conveying that. And so I'm glad that it's, it's, it started conversation. Um, and again, it's not necessarily the conversation between the David Newells and the Steve DiBiases and the Normas who understand <clears throat> the, 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 the large concept, living sacrifice, and, as, and your life is an act of worship to God. <clears throat> you display that with how you speak and what you do and how you live and how you treat people and your, your submitted state. Um, it, it may be more for those who are coming into the faith and coming into this church culture, wherever it may be, whatever it may be, look like, and they can unintentionally begin to, because we do that so much with our lives. Here's the time for this. Here's the, and there's that kind of discipline is, for the most part, probably pretty good. But I think we just need to be very intentional about teaching that worship is you are now in a state of worship as we give thanks, right? We live in this state of thanksgiving for our salvation, for our being, for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we worship him. We, and we try to be as intentional with that. We try to... We try to live that in a state of worship and demonstrate that. And then as in, often as possible with our intentionality, we, we look at those, the sky. We look at the stars. We look at the, the, the birds. We look at well, whatever the case may be. We look at our children. We look at a gathering of people. We look at church, we look, whatever. And we intentionally, oh, Lord, God, thank you. You know, I worship you. I thank you. We look at the strength that we have when we hear bad news or have to go through difficult times and we feel that peace, right? We, we understand the joy that is still with us, emanating from us, even though our circumstances, the world is, is telling us to be bitter. The world is telling us to turn our backs. The world is telling us to fear, but we do not any of those things, right? And we worship, we say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, uh, Steve, that's what I'm, I'm saying is, you know, that is part of the, isn't it part of the walk, as we say, the sanctification, isn't, and, and not just the sanctification of the individual believer, but the sanctification of a church gathering. Let's not forget how that applies. When the Holy Spirit binds believers together, we become one body of Christ. That body goes through a journey and a regeneration as people come and people go and generations come and generations go. I can't imagine all of the iterations of the church town, Church of God, since it has been around since 1833. You know what I mean? So what has it looked like and sounded like and been like? And I'm sure some have been awesome and some have been not so awesome and some have been whatever, all across the gamut because we're people. And, and we, you know, we must exist in this submitted state, this desire and willingness to allow him to be in charge, not us, and be okay. I always preach. You give your life to Christ and you say, Lord... Is that just, you know, teach me, talk to me, fill me, those sorts of things. Or is that just because of that one circumstance? And when that circumstance is past, your enthusiasm and submission will pass? You know, or is that a relationship that you're going to establish now and be intentional with? And I, again, I use the analogy of mar uh, marriage quite often. You marry your wife and the, and the passion and the, the excitement and the mountaintop moment and the, all of those different things. And then from that point on, there are a great many days that it's intentional. You know, I mean, but and it's not just because it gets <clears throat> bland. It's that relationship building and relationship maintaining is those are verbs it's what we do. I, why would I marry my wife? I say this all the time. And then only speak to her once a week. 
So it's intentionality. Awesome. Oh, stop, Steve. You're awesome. You're fantastic. So, yeah. You know, so good stuff, man. Good stuff. I'm glad to hear that, you know, all that pushback from church leaders. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that it, it makes congregation, church, everybody think that let's not compartmentalize this. Because we've all seen the negative effects of this, or have we? Have you ever been like in a worship culture type of a thing where you'll have the person on their cell phone drinking their coffee and then the worship music will come on? You know, looking around, making sure that they're in with everyone else and then the music stops, cell phone, coffee. You see what I'm saying? Like, and then it's over and then it's like, oh, that was just awesome. Woohoo. And they sit down. Next. Next is the sermon. Next is the whatever. You see what I'm saying? And so you don't want to create, I should say, an art. You want to create a worship culture. That was probably very poor wording. You don't want to create an artificial worship culture <clears throat> where you're sort of behaving because of peer pressure or behaving because this is, has been regimented in. This is your 20 minutes to do this. This is your 20 minutes to behave this way. Look around at everybody else. It's what they're doing, so do it. So we don't, you know, and you're like, how do you prevent that? You know, you just keep doing it in your venue the way I keep doing it in mine. You try to be intentional. You try to talk. You try to teach. You, you bring forth different scenarios, different orders of worship, different, you know, and, and we walk through it together and we grow together as a body. So it's not, you're not like, oh, you know, here's my book. Here's Brian's book and how to do this. Here's Brian's book on how to do it. So, you, you know, you just, you want to be, again, I keep using that word, intentional with it. So, anyway, thank you for that conversation. I think it is important as individuals and as churches and, um, and you know, what to always take a step and look and, and you know, what, 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 what are the actual goals of the experience? Submission, worship, living sacrifice. Hearing, this is what I preached the other day, two weeks ago, two Sundays ago. Hearing God's voice. And being okay with it. Because so many people will come, again, there's an issue in their life. Good morning, Renee. There's an issue in their life. There's something that drives them to church. It may be Holy Spirit speaking. It may be however, whatever the case may be. And, and this isn't the case with every new believer, certainly. But uh, so many folks will be driven because they're looking for a solution or they're looking for a peace or they're looking for fill in the blank. And so Jesus presents. And, he sa and, and really what Jesus is saying is, yes, I can help. This is not all I can do. But one, you know, and, and, and also you say, okay, I want to hear from you, God. I, wanna, I, I give my life to you. I want to hear from you. And then they hear from God and they just don't like what they hear. <clears throat> I came to church <clears throat> to hook up with you, God, so you could take care of this problem. And actually you're telling me, no, I want you to go through it so you can learn. I came to church to hook up with you, God, so you could, you know, fill my checkbook. But you're saying, no, <laughs> you know, some, you know, you will be doing exactly what you should be doing and, and work your way through it. It's going to make you a better person. Well, wait a minute. I came to church, Father God, to be healed because I keep hearing this bad news about my health. Why am I not here? You know, it's, we, it's what we hear from God. And, and that's where a lot of people get off the boat, so to speak, to use the analogy, get off the boat. Um, it's not what they want to hear. We have to be submitted to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray to hear from him. We pray for him to move in our lives, all of those different things. We pray, Holy Spirit, stir, teach, all of those things. And then we're, we also must be okay with what he says and what he does. Those are, those are two different things. 
and, and it may be more emotionally or situationally driven, but Christ will always be relationally and salvationally driven. And those two things are often at odds, and what it amounts to is my will and what I want, his will and what he sees. And as often as not, I'm, you know, the individual is going to go with their will. That's not why I came to church. I did not come to church to not be healed. I did not come to church to not receive the answer I wanted. You were supposed, I came, I said all the right things, I prayed, and you didn't do what I wanted. So I'm out. Um, and so that's not obedience. That's not submission. That is your strong-willed, hard-headed attitude toward life and your life. So, oh yeah, we, we all do, Renee. We all do. I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of that. You know, you, again, we come back to this word intentionality. Um, one of the greatest strengths that we can have as believers, Renee, is simply being conscious of that. So when I preach that and I teach that and I, I see people doing the same thing I'm doing, yes, yeah, ooh, yes, I hear that, you know, all I'm really trying to do is, what, what do we say, raise awareness. You know, this is, you, you don't want to be wrapped up in self like that and then forsake God. But you do understand that you, you get mad. You're like, that's not what I asked for. Are you, why are you doing this? Okay, all right, all right, all right. Let's find out where the Lord wants me to go. Let's find out what's next. I trust you. I love you. I trust you. Go. See? So, I mean, yeah, easy. Piece of cake. But you know, Renee, you know I've been there and done that. You know, I'm, you know I've been there and done that. Um, and there was a point even in time when, uh, you know, we were being called into the ministry, and I say we, because when, when an individual is called, your spouse is called, your family is called, we were called, being called into the ministry, and Kelly and I were just, we were going through all of these things, and we kept saying, if this is real, because it's financially impossible, we're too far in debt, it is just socially impossible, you know, it's, it's career-wise, it would be suicide for me to do this, because I've got such a great career, and I'm making so much money, we'll never be able to pay the bills, and, and all of these long list of reasons why I could not respond, the Lord just kept knocking them down one by one, and, and some of them were absolutely just miraculous signs. And finally, you know, I turned to Kelly one time and I always tell this story that we, we've got to stop, like, putting God to the test like this. I mean, he has been so good and so faithful. You know, even with things like it, um, kicking the nicotine addiction, you know, and learning to play the guitar and preparing me in different odd ways to be healthier, emotionally better, spiritually better, um, personally better, all of these different things, this process that I went through taught me to trust him. Mm -hmm. Anger binds. Anger is a, it makes you a slave. It makes you a slave. Oh, there's no... Yeah, we are in sync. Oh, I thought you said something else, Steve. Sometimes I go back through and I see comments that I totally missed. Minute-by-minute mm -hmm. minute basis. I thought I'd missed something. There we go. But see, that one of the things that we talk about all the time is when you are bound by your circumstances, um, you, you are, those are the chains that bind us spiritually and emotionally. And when, when we receive salvation and we recognize salvation for what it is, everything. When our life becomes Jesus plus nothing, I don't need Jesus plus my car, my money, my family. Jesus teaches us that. We talked about that yesterday. Family, friends, 
He says, no one can put their hand to the plow and look back and follow me. He says, you must hate your mother, your brother, you know, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister. Jesus says, who is my mother is out there waiting for me? Who, who is my mother and my brother? My mother and my brother and my family are all those who believe. Time and time again, Jesus teaches us this core concept because he knows how difficult it is. But at any rate, when it becomes Jesus plus nothing, Jesus plus zero external circumstances. Um, oh, man. You talk about liberating, liberating from guilt, liberating from anger, liberating from worry, liberating from anxiety. Not that things don't creep in. Not that it's perfect all of the time. No, but that core of my being is the place to which I can go whenever those chains start wrapping themselves around my neck again. I can go to the core of my being, who is Jesus Christ, who broke those chains. I have Jesus plus nothing. And that extends from Jesus plus something superficial like my home or my car to Jesus plus something very intimate like my wife or my family. It's true. When Jesus talks about conquering sin and death, he talks about conquering our desire for sin, our desire to sin, our love of sin. And what does he mean about conquering death? Well, it's multifold. He certainly conquers death as our, our, our souls, which will live forever, will be with him forever. And on the second coming, we, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. We will remain conscious, cognizant beings. But there is a facet of conquering death here on earth. And that is conquering the fear of death. And I've preached about this and, and I've talked about it here. And many people understand it. They're like, you don't understand it. They, they say, Are you, you're preaching that it would be okay to kill yourself. No, not at all. Not at all. I love life and I am no hurry. I'm in no hurry to speed this whole process up. My point is I am released of the fear of death. I shared with you a saying that all of the thing, the thing, and I'm trying to, I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember the exact wording of it, but it was, you know, all of life is, is simply trying to distract us from the fear of dying. So we do thing after thing after thing after thing to try to take our minds off this fear of dying. I don't have a fear of dying. And I'm released from that slavery as well. So there's an aspect of conquering sin and death here. As well, right? Um, when you're conquered of that fear. Anyway, we talked about freedom. This is what brought us, you know, being, um, being bound. You say, my anger binds me. I know. All right? But we, we can't also always use the excuse, I'm just human and I'm struggling. The power of God has released that. So giving ourselves over to that... Um, you know, sometimes when I need attention drawn to myself, like from Kelly or from the congregation or from whomever, I will do this, I'll do that, I'll act a certain way. What's wrong, Brian? What's wrong, Brian? Everything okay, Brian? Oh, I just need, because I need something. And then I recognize, I know why I'm behaving this way. I need this. And I take it and then I move on. And I, I get my head on my rear end and I do what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, because ultimately I come back to that heart of worship that we talked about. I come back to the place where it's Jesus plus nothing. I'm good. I'm good. And that is, that is absolute freedom. Absolute freedom. So anyway, good stuff, man. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Right? So amazing that Pastor Susie 
has fallen asleep. We are going to the radio station this afternoon, and uh, we're going to record our programs. I think, I don't know, I'm trying to think what we're talking about, because I've been so busy. Poor Jeremy. I mean, he does a, Jeremy Ross at WPFG, fantastic. And he, he, he really has everything ready. I really do have it easy. And I'll be the first to share that with him and give him all the kudos. He prepares and he produces and all of these things. And I go in and I get to provide content. Kind of like what I'm doing here. And it's just awesome. So he, he's a fantastic person. He wants to make a career in radio. I pray, pray that you know we will be in this position sometime that we can provide actual career positions where people can say yes and you know this is what I want to do and, and where I want to be invested and we can be able to provide back a really a great living doing that. And um, so that's what we're praying for there at WPFG um, when we're not praying simply for the Lord to return. So that's it, folks. Good talk. <clears throat> Maundy Thursday, 7 p.m. It's an unusual and incredible and reverent service. Choir tonight. Wednesday morning word tomorrow morning. Thursday. Maundy Thursday. Good Friday is going to be a, a special day. Uh, for a variety of different reasons. Saturday night at 7, you do not want to miss Randy Simpson and Victory Express here at the church at 7. Saturday night, come and celebrate with us. And uh, of course, Sunday morning, wherever you're going, invest, invest, invest in Resurrection Sunday. Here, it'll be 8 o'clock, probably indoors at 8 o'clock. It's just looking like it's going to be 30 something, like this morning. And that's Okay, we'll come in and we'll start belting it out in here at 8 o'clock. Hopefully it's gorgeous and we can go outside and mill around and stuff. But um, if it's only 30-something, I'm not going to go out there with my guitar and try to play my guitar with a parka on. and ah, ah. <laughs> Let's go get breakfast quick. There is so much more I want to tell you, Jesus says. I want to leave you with this. Because this is the journey that we are on. Whether you're watching today and you're a non-believer and you're thinking about it, that you feel Holy Spirit tugging at your heart and you're curious, whether you are a, a new believer, a, a long time submitted believer, this is the journey that we are on. And Jesus himself teaches, stay the course because I am sending Holy Spirit and he will enlighten you in all things. You will know more and more and more as time goes on, as, you know, as time goes on as a church throughout the course of history and as an individual believer in your sanctification process. He says, there is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. There, there, there's only so right this, this, this intensity of what is happening this week. Jesus knows. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. <clears throat> he will not speak on his own, but he will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said, the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. Part of our submission, part of our worship, uh, it's all kind of useless behaviors without the, without the power of Holy Spirit. As we worship God, we worship you, Holy Spirit. So, thank you, Jesus, for drawing us together this morning. Thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for binding us together and teaching us, convicting us, moving us. Thank you for the conversation. Help us to be living sacrifices. Help us to understand worship as who we are, not just what we do. It's not a 20-minute period on Sunday morning. We are Christ worshipers. And thank you 
for what you have done that has freed us from sin and death in this world and the next. Dear Jesus, we love you and we appreciate you. It's in your mighty and matchless name that we give ourselves to you. You go and have incredible days. Good morning, Mary. And uh, just know how much I uh, appreciate you guys. Keep the conversation rolling. It's how we're going to, uh, right, change the world. One conversation at a time.